the mystery of the gospel. Brother Paul's words concerning this phrase, concerning this matter of the mystery of the gospel, comes at the end of this letter, what I like to call possibly the preeminent letter of his ministry, of his ministry in the sense that in this document, in this letter, he is addressing the issue of God's eternal purpose. Now that's a big idea, if you want to say it that way. That's the one huge thought. But Paul's the only one who speaks about it. He's the only one who mentions that phrase. And he doesn't just mention it and walk away. <laughs> he expounds it for us in this letter. The word mystery is used in our New Testament documents, if you want to call them that, New Testament scriptures, 27 times. More than half of those, more than half of those 27 times is in 1 Corinthians, Ephesians, and Colossians, all, all written by the Apostle Paul. It's mentioned a few times in the Gospels. Our Savior, the Master, uh, mentioned the term mysteries uh, there in Mark 13, when he was talking about the parables, when, he's, when he was giving some exposition for the apostles, for the, his disciples, about his parable teaching. So the idea is revelation. Now, <laughs> in some sense, you might think the term mystery and revelation is connected. Yes, it is. <laughs> it is. Because this is a mystery that's now no longer a mystery. <laughs> it's been revealed. That's what we want to emphasize in these things. Now, Brother Paul uses this phrase here at the end of the letter, as I mentioned. And at the end of this crucial text where he's expounding for us the whole armor of God and urging the believers to put it on, prepare yourself. Prepare yourself. Put these things on. You wrestle not against flesh and blood. Take up unto you the whole armor of God. Your loins girt with truth. The breastplate of righteousness. Your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Taking up above all, he says, taking up the shield of faith. To quench the fiery darts of the wicked. The helmet of salvation. The sword of the spirit. The word of God. Praying always with all prayer, supplication in the Spirit, watching thereto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Boy, those are huge thoughts. Each one of those phrases you preach from, couldn't you? Yeah. Amen. And then he concludes, and for me. Uh -huh. Now, again, this is, a, this is a stunning thing from my perspective. <laughs> it should be for all of us. That the Apostle Paul, this premier figure, premier soldier, warrior in this battle says pray for me intercede for me I need undergirding I need assistance, I need intercession, I need God's help and, and we all know that the manner of the kingdom is fellowship with God Amen. that's what he's doing he's pulling us, he's drawing us into he's granted us fellowship with himself by his son Christ Jesus, in his son Christ Jesus. And this praying, of course, this communication is uh, a key aspect of this fellowship. When we all gathered here this morning, what did we do? We talked with one another, didn't we? <laughs> we didn't just come in and sit down and start eating and look around and watch each other. We talked one with another. It was, it was natural, normal. Some of us have been together for 40, 50 years, haven't we? Many of us for 25 years we've been together. And so when we gather face to face, we speak. Well, we speak even when we don't gather face to face, don't we? <laughs> with the new communication methods, uh, the uh, current communication methods that we have, we communicate one with another. I read things that Brother Al writes every day. Things that Brother Given writes every day. Amen. 
and for me that utterance may be given unto me. These are not things that Brother Paul uh, generated himself, the things that he preached and things that he writes. Of course, when he says utterance, he's also talking about what he's writing. And we're glad for that. That I may open my mouth boldly. Boldly, he did that. You know. And we're interested in doing that as well. We want to be aggressive about these things. We are talking about the truth, aren't we? We are. We're, we're in a battle. We dwell among people who are not at all interested in what we're speaking about now. They think, well, that's fine for you. Leave me alone. Don't interfere with the things that we're interested in and busy with. With that stuff, that's fine for you people and, and, your, and, and your stuff in your religious buildings and your religious gatherings, but don't bother us when it comes to the business world. Don't bother us when it comes to the political world. Don't bother us when it comes to, to our social interests and my personal life. Don't bother me with that stuff. See, we're in a battle. Amen. You got to be bold that I may open my mouth boldly. You know, that's what Brother Paul did when he went into Athens, didn't he? Yeah, when he went into that place with the philosophers there who loved to, loved to talk about and hear about new things all the time. That's what they, oh, they were got, well, step right up there. Mr. Paul, step right up there. We'd like to hear what you've got to say. It's a, you've brought some new things to our ears. And he sure did. And he was aggressive about it, wasn't he? He declared it to them. He didn't hesitate one bit. He wasn't backwards. He wasn't, now I'd like to suggest a little something to you here. Perhaps, maybe, no, not at all. He just laid it out right there and challenged them to believe it or reject it. Let us do the same, brethren. Amen. That I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. There you've got that paradox. Make known the mystery. Well, it was a mystery. It was a mystery in the sense we didn't know it. We didn't know it. He's revealing these things. But Paul is the source of our understanding about these things, these eternal things, this eternal purpose. The word that's translated eternal, by the way, to translate eternal and everlasting 71 times in the New Testament scripture. 71 times. Uh, 26 times is translated everlasting and 45 times is translated eternal. That is something that it just keeps going. It doesn't stop. It goes beyond the point which you can see. If you move, it's still there. You move forward, you move forward, you move forward, it's still there in front of you. It just keeps going. There's no wall up there. It doesn't fall over the edge anywhere, you might say. This is a concept that, well, Solomon didn't talk about it, did he? What he talked about was just under the sun. It was limited. We know it was limited. He fell over the edge himself, didn't he? It appears that he did anyway. We don't know his eternal end for certain, but it sure doesn't look good. It doesn't look good. The Lord God told him there at the end, you've not done unto me what is right like your father David. I'm going to take the kingdom from you, but not from you, from your son. All of us older ones know that would be more crushing to have it happen to you than to have something like that happen to you, wouldn't it, to have it happen to your children. So that's the concept here that we're talking about is these eternal things, this mystery of the gospel. It's eternal. Brother Paul unveils and expounds this disclosure right at the beginning of his letter, in fact. You're familiar with these words. Let me lay them out for you, where he extols the wonderful works of our God, which are his counsels of old. See, that's his paradox again. Brother Isaiah uses those phrases here. 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. That's pretty big. That goes way back. Yeah. That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. These are the things Brother Jason was just preaching about, this transformation. That we should be holy and blameless before him in love. In love. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace. That's all part of this eternity. See. Wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will. See, this is the exposition of these things. The mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he hath proposed or purposed in himself. That's eternity. That's everlasting for something. Something that God proposes and purposes in himself is everlasting. I am that I am, he said to Brother Moses. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times now that's God pinpointing something right here and, and, and again it's, it's not just that time is going on and God says oh that's a good spot not at all no he made the time he, made, he, fill, he, he appoints the time and then he fills it up and then brings it to pass that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth. That's eternity again, see, everlasting. Even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Now that's an exposition of God's eternal purpose. This mystery, this mystery, a lofty spiritual thoughts and words which, which transmit to our mind. See, this is the revelation of this mystery. It's, it, it's carrying, these words are carrying these thoughts to us so that we can grasp them Amen. and we can take hold of them. I like to think of these individual thoughts that Brother Paul says we've just read as like tributaries leading to the ocean of God's eternal purpose. These thoughts lead us to that vast arena. You can't see across it. You can't see the bottom. Okay? They're not elemental or simple things. You must yield your heart and mind, the space and the time in them, Grant them the dominion of space and time in your being. Then, then, God will begin to open this up for your thinking and your perception. Amen. You can't give yourself, as we've already talked about Amen. this morning. Brother Jason's informed us uh, very ably. You can't give yourself to the things that the world is interested in, to things that are going to pass away. If you do, you can't have these things. There's, no, there's barely enough room in us for these things, huh? Amen. You give yourself to the, all these other things, you'll not get this. Amen. You'll have no understanding. And it's not surprising then, is it, that the nominal church gives themselves, they give themselves to the, to the world, things that the world cares about. Well, then that's what they're going to emphasize. That's what they're going to care about. And you start talking about the eternal purpose of God, and you've got possibly crossed eyes, at least glazed eyes, What's that have to do with us? What's that mean for me? You'll see, th you'll hear things like that. You know. So faith is the key to understanding the, anything from God. The gospel is His specific instrument by which He, by which we are engaging, engaging this eternal purpose of God. We. You might say we embark, we get on the boat, we embark, 
and travel on the river of his delights. The heavenly places, both now and in the ages to come, with a special emphasis, of course, on that ages to come. So we must embrace this God's revelation in this matter. And the gospel is this message. That's what it is. It's a message of truth, God's truth, God's wrath, and his justice. But it's bound up with his wisdom and mercy and goodness, his favor or his grace. All of this, all of this together. As Brother David wrote for us, this text that we're all familiar with, surely his salvation is nigh to them that fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness, peace have kissed each other. Truth shall spring out of the earth. Righteousness shall look down from heaven. So we know, brethren, our only hope of escape from God's own wrath. That's what God's saving us from, by the way. Amen. He's saving us from himself. Amen. We're not being saved from the devil. Well, in, indirectly you are, I guess. Uh, it's a byproduct. You do get saved from the devil in, in some sense. But God's not paying anything to Satan. There's no ransom given to him. He doesn't own anything. Nothing belongs to him. It never has. He only has what's been granted to him. Any time, any space, anything, it's just been granted to him. And he's just misused it. He thought to keep it and obtain more for himself. That's what he thought. But he's going to lose it all in the end, isn't he? He's already lost his possessions. The strong man has lost it because someone stronger entered into the house, tied him up and took him. Tied him up and took him. Now, in our current generation, I don't want to speak too much about this. We all live in it. Our current generation of relativity, the cornerstone of it, of course, is individual appetites and interests and values. And those who, who are enslaved by those things, they press to obtain those things in whatever way they can, arguing, demanding, begging, debating, sympathy, demanding intellectually or economically or politically. However they can get it, they're going to get it. You're going to give me what I want. See, Well, we've escaped. Brother Peter says, we've escaped the corruption that's in the world we? by this mystery. Amen. By this mystery. So what I want to emphasize, well, by contrast, the gospel is a message of an innocent man. Now that appeals to a lot of people on its face, doesn't it? An innocent man. Who though he demonstrated, eminently demonstrated divine qualities and power beyond, even beyond human comprehension, he submitted himself to the outpouring of human hatred against those very same qualities. They didn't want to see that. They did not want to see that. He was the day star of godly reality, walking among, walking on the footpaths and the streets and the roads of Israel. Never, never had Israel witnessed such goodness and purity and wisdom. Yet, when the appointed time came, even those opponents said, not during the feast, lest the people riot. That was the appointed time, wasn't it? And so God worked that they demanded his execution. He is worthy of death, they told the Roman procurator, because he claimed to be the son of God. Now we know Pilate wanted to say, that has nothing to do with me. But he couldn't. It was the time, you see. They demanded his execution at the hands of godless men, and he submitted to it. This is, this is the, you might say, the, the skeletal bones of this mystery. He submitted to it, and no man knew 
that this was the means of God's justice and his justification that's now revealed in this gospel. So I want to emphasize or begin by emphasizing that this gospel is a revelation. We would not know it. No man, no man's going to discover it's a mystery. Not previously known, but now known. It's revealed in the divine. Men would and could never discover it by investigation, by research, by testing, by examining uh, physical evidence or artifacts, fi other physical materials. There are none, are there? The Apostle Peter never referred to any physical artifacts when he preached this message, did he? In Jerusalem, at Cornelius' household. Now, he did talk about the witnesses. We are witnesses of these things, he said. So I guess you could say they were the physical, they were the physical evidence in some sense. But he never said, you know, you can go right out to the tomb. I can show you. He never said that in his preaching, did he? Or, 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 we, or we keep his grave clothes uh, in this box back here and, I, and let me open it and show you. No, he never said any such thing, did he? This message is not like that. It's not like that at all. It's a revelation as to the central issues revealed in it. Apostolic preaching and exhortation do not appeal to physical things except the chosen witnesses. They declared the staggering work of God finished and completed and accomplished by the Father in heaven and by the Son upon the earth. In heavenly places where there's glory, peace, and light while the sun was in the earth, where there's sin and guilt and darkness and death. They together worked this great redemption in the works and words and body and shed blood of God's own lamb. That's how he was introduced, wasn't he? First introduced to Israel. Behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Mystery, see, mystery, now revealed, now known, spoken by this one, the greatest of the prophets. Now we also have a, uh, we also have a record of this, of the anticipation of these things, the promise of these things before, before it was executed in and on the cross. In fact, our master spoke of it coming to pass even as it happened there in Jerusalem, didn't he? In and around Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. He, even as he was doing these things, God kept these things a mystery in himself and in his son, even as he walked the earth. His disciples heard these words they, they, they didn't understand. In fact, in some cases, it was the record says it was kept from them. Until the, until the appointed time. It was kept from them. Well, Brother Peter mentions that in this key text, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently. Those in the past had done that. Now, he experienced it, but those before him knew something was coming. They wanted to know more details. It was revealed to them. It was not for them to know. Not for them to know. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of, pardon me, the sufferings of Christ, the glories that would follow, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you by the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. Revealed, see, revelation, revelation, things into which angels desire to look. Even they even it was, it was even revealed to them. So God's spirit then at, at the appointed time unveiled this truth to the hearts of those, in the hearts of those which spoke it. The glory of God, the salvation of believers. It's at the time and the manner and by the method and through the people that God chose from him, through him, and to him are all things. He managed this. See, he, he made these things happen.
even though Brother Paul was the primary instrument of this mystery, this phrase, mystery, this term. Again, Brother Peter speaks about that. Our beloved, our beloved Brother Paul, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you in all his epistles, speaking in them of things in which are some things hard to understand. The Apostle Peter said that about what Paul wrote. Some things hard to understand. It shouldn't be surprising you've got to apply yourself to these things. They're not there on the bottom shelf where the toddlers can get a hold of them. Not so. So the gospel is a revelation. It's also, it is, it is the chosen means. There is no other. There's nothing that someone's developing in their religious theories and concepts and ideas. I read uh, part of a paper, part of an essay that was referred to uh, not long ago on a, re on a religious site uh, where some, this, this person had supposedly rearranged the gospels, the record of the gospel to make it fit something that they wanted it to fit. Well, that's not surprising, is it? People have done that. Well, Jesus' enemies wanted to do that to him. They wanted to take him apart and rearrange him to make him fit their agenda, didn't they? They wanted to take and make him king. Or, the, or, or his, his particular, that, that was the common people, his particular opponents at the beginning would have allied themselves with him if he had only turned into their agenda. Wouldn't they? Yeah. But this is God's redemption. This is his salvation. See, the emphasis is revelation. Revelation. A message of God's work through the ages of sinful human existence and despite human rebellion against his abundant kindness and mercy and wisdom and truth. That's what we have in the record about Israel. They rejected, for the most part, they rejected what God sought to grant them and give them. And the only part they received, they wanted to turn it and make it into what they could use for their agenda and for their interests. He acted countless times favoring them because of his promises to the fathers, but their hearts turned away. Their hearts turned away again and again. However, God kept the course. Amen. He kept the course of his promises. And he worked in this remnant who had faith. Yes. Yes. Only a few. Yes. Now 7,000 in the days of Elijah may sound like quite a crowd. <laughs> but how many was that compared to the population? Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, Elijah didn't even know about them, did he? The prophet didn't even know about this 7,000. So God kept the course of his promises. Those without faith, those who rejected him, well, he just removed them out of the way. They didn't benefit. They didn't get any of the good things, you might say, that way. He moved through the ages, shaping and forming the time and people and places. He'd raise up even powerful irreligious men like Sennacherib or Nebuchadnezzar or Cyrus or Alexander the Great and put them in places, in certain places, of course, of course, we, we can say that Nebuchadnezzar, you know, turned some. The rest of them didn't. Their, their names are mentioned in the record, but they're not the prominent personalities, are they? They're not the prominent personalities. And, uh, oh, that's right, that last guy wasn't even mentioned, was he? Huh. What was his name, Alexander? Now, you think by comparison what human historians think of each of these individuals. Why, they are enormous, aren't they? You turn on any kind of historical documentary and it'll likely mention some of these guys in, in one form or another. There have been books written. There have been media portrayals of uh, these individuals, Alexander the Great. He's not even mentioned in the scripture record, is he? His name's not even mentioned. This is God's salvation, you see. That's right. And if you don't count with him, uh -huh. well, uh -huh. there you go. 
That's what God thinks of. What heaven, heaven's estimation of human yeah. idols. Yeah. Men that other men raise up to idolatry. But God worked to fill up the time and bring forth his son in Israel, the house of David, in the body of this godly Mary, whom no one knew. In the house and the workshop of righteous Joseph, whom no one knew. The angel said, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto Mary thy wife, that which is conceived in hers of the Holy Ghost. She shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. He shall save his people from their sins. This mystery, you see. The father did this through his only begotten son, also called the son of man. Which refers, of course, to substitution or our representation before God, Son of Man. The only thing that we supplied was the need for it. That is sin. That's called sin. That's the need. Sin against God, which had to be removed, had to be resolved by proper payment. The ransom by an approved, an approved price. In this case, sacrifice. In this case, human sacrifice. Now, especially in our culture and society, in our generation, that thought is, now wait just a minute. What kind of God is that? Maybe you've heard somebody say or read something like that. That someone said, what kind of bloodthirsty deity are you serving? Are you suggesting? How could a good God demand such a that? Well, they just don't know what's at stake here, do they? They don't know what's at stake. And at the same time, in the media, such people will pay millions of dollars and give hours and hours of time and attention clamoring for stories of murderers and vampires and violent stories, monsters of the human imagination. They glorify these people, hold them up, the actors who play these parts. Oh, these are wonderful people. Oh, we want to put them on the stage. We want to hear anything they say. We want to know where they live. It's hypocritical is what it is. They're all playing a game. The whole thing's a game. The whole thing's made up. It's a play. I'm talking about the ones who adore the actors, too. It's all just a play. It's imagination. It's all in their imagination. What we're talking about is a revelation from God of his redemption to bring us to himself. The reality, the reality of Jesus' sacrifice and the divine resolve to resolve these matters, matters that pertain to God, not matters that pertain to us, not political, social, or individual expediency, what's good for me? What does it mean for me? No such thing. That doesn't enter in here. Now, it is good for those who believe, but it's those who submit in faith, those who yield themselves, the parts of their body, to God, as instruments of righteousness because of this regeneration, you see. Brother Paul calls it reconciliation, another big term here, reconciliation. Now, the ungodly, of course, they refuse to face these things, and they'd like to point the finger at God. How dare, how dare he? What kind of God is that? It, well, they don't know because these are things pertaining to God, not pertaining to us. Amen. See, spiritual realities. You've got to submit in faith for God's approval. Brother Jason just referred to God's approval on the last day. Not human approval. Not the approval of the voters. Not, not a referendum for the people to express their thoughts and ideas. Not so. No such thing. God's not asking anybody's opinion about this. He never has. What do you think, Moses? Moses? Would you like to join me? Not so. You shall. 
I'm sending you, God said. He had to be persuaded, but it was only because of his weakness. But God made him strong, didn't he? Who made your mouth? Who made your mouth? I'll put my words in your mouth. Your brother Aaron shall be your prophet, and I shall make you as God to Pharaoh. And he was. By the time they left, Pharaoh's court was terrified of Moses, weren't they? Speaking of Moses, his law, the law that he revealed, the ordinances of divine service and the worldly sacrifice, well, they gave us types and shadows of these things, but they're just the elemental things, not the reality. Not the reality. We who believe in the Savior, we have that reality. This revelation of God's grace in Christ Jesus, the reality of these things made known. A cleansed conscience approved of God, accepted in his sight and his presence, the price paid, the revelation of a completed project or enterprise completed by God in godly wisdom, chosen witnesses reporting these things in the preaching of the gospel. They, and they witnessed its execution, but didn't know. They didn't know, did they? Even as they saw it happening, Brother John standing there at the cross with his arm around Mary, didn't know what was happening. The next, you know, some hours later, as they ran to the tomb, And John outran Peter. They didn't know what was happening, did they? They got to the tomb and John hesitated and Peter went right on in. They heard what the women said, the sisters, but they didn't believe. They had to be reprimanded. You should have believed what they said, the master said. You should have believed. So that's the mandate for us, isn't it? We should believe these things of this everlasting, this eternal gospel. Here's what John wrote about it. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Saying with a loud voice, and we remember that no angel preached this. This is the vision that John saw. Saying with a loud voice, Fear God. Give him glory. See, that's the, that's the ultimate effect. Those who believe will fear God and give him glory. Willingly, for the hour of his judgment has come, worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of the waters. Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. Not every confessor will enter in. Not everyone will. Only those who believe now in this day of salvation and this time of God's favor. Now God himself spoke about these things in the garden, its embryonic form, to our father and mother in the flesh, the first Adam. Then came what I like to call, or I'm going to call this morning, a, a period of gestation, a long period, moving toward the fullness of time, the time of the law and the prophets, the record of Israel's generations. But eventually it came to its inauguration. Angels over the, over the fields in Bethlehem announced it. And then came the testimony, the living testimony of these things, eternal things. Jesus walking among those lost sheep of the house of Israel. And then it was announced that day, on that day of Pentecost, that particular chosen. All of this, all of this was built upon the foundation laid before the world began. As has been said, the only one I've ever heard say this is Brother Given, planned on the trestle boards of heaven before time began. Spiritual realities now made fully known in the gospel of our redemption. It was just not known in the earth until then. And among men, in Israel, even in Israel, 
the provision that God made for his own name, his holiness and his goodness, summed up in his righteousness in Christ Jesus, the Savior of all men, especially those who believe. Now, these things are true before men knew them, before anybody believed them. They were true. And they remain true, though some refuse to believe. And as I said earlier, it needs no human authority, no referendum for approving the power of the gospel that accomplishes what it does in the believing heart. God has already approved, and his approval is the only approval that's needed. And this unbelief has no influence. It can't stop what God is doing in us. It cannot. Doesn't matter about their political power. Doesn't matter about their social arguments and their cries of inequity and unfairness. And that's not right. Doesn't matter. What God has done is right. He is justified and he will be justified. He's true though all men be liars. And we, do rec uh, and we do acquire, those of us who believe, we acquire this benefit that was promised Father Abraham. The blessing of Abraham in the gospel. Our God is satisfied. Our God is pleased. Our God is blessed in the realities of the gospel of his son Jesus Christ. Let all the earth be still and know that he is God most high as does heaven and hell already know so brethren in conclusion again the words of brother Paul without controversy great is the mystery of godliness God was manifest in the flesh justified in the spirit seen of angels preached among the Gentiles believed on in the world received up into glory and this glory is the destiny of all who believe in God's Son, full of grace and truth. He is bringing us to his Father through this world of toil and trouble, affluence, deprivation, deception, truth and light and darkness, all of this mixed together here. Well, he's bringing us all through it. And, of course, the things that cannot last are going to fall off. And the only things that will remain are the things that have to do with the riches of God's grace in the ages to come. Even so, God's grace and peace to you by faith in this gospel. Thank you, brother.